poslechli českou, český překlad, ať si sednou tam, k, já nevím, jak se jmenuje, soudružka. A, 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 jak? Pardon, Romeo. A, a, ať si sednou tam, aby poslechli a, simultánní překlad. And now I'll uh, switch to English. And uh, so thanks again for everyone um, coming out on this fine Saturday afternoon. And uh, enjoy the shade while we're indoors, half indoors, half outdoors. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm only here, uh, Joe Grim Feinberg, but my only task is to introduce my friend and collaborator and co-editor, Sezgin Boynik from Rab Rab Press, uh, it's a Helsinki-based press that uh, I think I won't say too much about it because, ah, yeah, okay, it's going to be a change, okay. Good? Yeah, so, um, so again, we'll tell you more about, about the press, but press that does radical literature, also on art and the avant-garde and connections between the avant-garde and revolutionary politics. And uh, the two of us recently collaborated on a, an English translation of Karel Taiga's Jarmark Umnění, the marketplace of art in our English translation, and a uh, and number of other books. And, and Sezkin is going to take the chance to talk both about you know, what, a, what radical publishing can do in, in as part of radical movements and and about art and politics, revolution in general, uh, with a few examples from the books you've published and are planning to publish. Um, and yeah, and then we'll open it up to discussion for kind of, I think, I think the idea should be partly, you know, think practically, like how, how can we, how can radical publishing be a part of movements and what you think radical publishing can do and radical art, and what's the potential, what are the limitations, those kinds of things. So prepare your questions. I'm using this. Uh, thanks, Joe. And I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I uh, hope that you will find interesting these publications that I will present or this publishing project. Uh, I try to make it a bit more general introduction of what is Rab Rab Press standing for and what is the history of Rabra Press. But also I brought a one uh, copy of the book that is not in English, it is in Turkish language, that, he, that we just published with another initiatives that I am a part of in Kosovo and dealing with the socialist histories, local socialist histories, very interesting stories. So at the end, when we have a little time, I will also talk about this something else and Rabra Press. So Rab Rab Press started in 2014 as a journal, and a journal's title, subtitle was Journal for Political and Formal Inquiries in Art. And the main idea of the journal when we started was to think art, or today contemporary art productions, and the political aspect of that especially, outside of institutions, sort of how we can talk about the political and, let's say, any sort of relevance of contemporary art outside of institutions means outside of exhibiting institutions, uh, galleries, museums, whatsoever. It's not that we are against uh, exhibiting exhibition institutions, but we started to challenge a group of people or, of how to produce a, a knowledge that is not, let's say, a part of the, of the exhibition program of the institutions. And the idea was that, in fact, we produce our own materials. And the people who were involved in the journal, some artists, some politically more engaged people, we came with an idea that, in fact, everybody can write. Whoever has a practice, is able to write, you know? And in order to publish these annual journals, I unfortunately have nothing here but except the picture 
of the second issue is that we had like certain specific topics to start with. So the first issue was on indexing. Sort of how do you list, how do you index uh, questions? How do you, how do you, let's say, represent your corpus of information, whatever you have, and especially if that information is counter to informations or knowledge that are available. And the second issue, which will make more clear of how Rub Rub Journal is work, working, uh, was about noise. Uh, so there is a lot of interesting projects, interesting uh, uh, books, anthologies, special issues of journals on noise. But uh, we, well, we didn't make this issue as an overview of a current available scholarship or, or interventions of artistic projects on noise, but we had an idea of what actually uh, noise should be. And the title of this second issue is Noise Against Culture. So it started with an idea, it starts with a position that a noise, you know, at some point, especially in 2000s, a noise as a music genre became very popular. You know, sort of like a development of the, uh, maybe, a, let's say, a punk or more radical musical subcultures. The, uh, most of the uh, projects that we came across around the noise and around this subversive element of the music was based on one theory of Jacques Attali. Jacques Attali is a, a scholar, philosopher, who wrote a book called Noise, wrote in French, with the subtitle Political Economy of Music. It is very interesting book. I recommend you to check out. It's a small book, easy to read, and it has a very interesting at some parts, maybe even more interesting than book itself, an introduction written by Friedrich Jameson, American Marxist scholar. And uh, Jacques Attali's theory to really, let's say, uh, put it in, in, in the most uh, sketchy way, is very evolutionist, is very historicist understanding of noise. He claims that yesterday's noise is today's music. So whatever radical gesture in West was produced, in sound or in uh, other forms of culture, it's sooner or later recuperated. So what is a noise? Yesterday becomes today's music, becomes more bearable, becomes more more like a, a normal. And uh, then uh, is in the journal, we thought that this, this uh, description of noise is a very predictable and very, uh, very much based on the narrative that whatever radical gesture you do, it's doomed to failure. It's doomed to end up in the capitalist or mainstream dustbin, you know, in a, in a rubbish. So we came up, they said, no, is that possible to have some idea of noise as a noise against culture, which is yesterday's noises that still today are noise. Something that was not, uh, are not easily recuperated and resist to be part of this mainstream culture. So that's why the radical thesis against culture, which means against this Culture is a very big term, you know, which absorbs everything. And in the end of the day, it's always like bourgeois culture, affirmation, reproduction of the existing uh, structures, of the existing way of how things are handled, done, disseminated, produced, and all that. So what are those noises? I mean, this is, it is easy to come with a hypothesis, the strong 
let's say, a gesture, the sloganistic ideas, but then the work was done to find out few examples. Maybe if you can, yeah, go to the next one. And yeah, this uh, magazine now completely sold out, but if you go on uh, in our website, it's rubrub.net, or if you just write in Google rubrub press, you can download PDFs of these books, journals. If you can go the next one, so in fact, yeah, you cannot read here, but uh, just some of the uh, some of the contributors or some of let's say content of this issue might give a picture of what that noise is. It is a, a very strong critique. One text that I am really proud of by a Finnish musician, saxophone player also, and a free jazz musician and a scholar on uh, Luigi Russolo. Mm. Luigi Russolo was a guy who write, uh, wrote a manifesto for futurism, Italian futurists, called Art of Noises. And uh, interesting, the text compares, because it's more or less the same year uh, written, by one text author compares this Luigi Russolo's uh, manifesto with one text by Rosa Luxemburg. Yes, and uh, in fact, what uh, author is doing is show, because, no, I forget to mention the main thing, Luigi Russolo was a futurist, Italian futurist, but like many other Italian futurists, surrendered to fascism, like Marinetti, like Ardengio Sofici, and many others, and, but still, scholars who deal with avant-garde are a bit puzzled that how come you have a progressive forms, because their forms were really progressive, very advanced, can end up in such a right-wing, conservative, fascist ideology. So the text, I'm particularly proud, because from the local writer, is showing that, in fact, Luigi Russolo's ideas of noise was not radical at all. That around, in the same time, the people who dealt with contemporaneity of the urban life were even more radical. Anyway, so you can check the text it's online. Another thing here, interesting, is an interview with Dror Feiler, who is based in Stockholm, but originally from Israel. And uh, he uh, is a noise musician. He has a couple of albums with, like, the genre noise musicians like Lasse Marhauk and others. But as well, he played in numerous uh, free jazz improvised bands. Uh, Dror Failure, we talk about the noise with him, but it's interesting because Dror Failure is for example, persona non grata in Israel, because he was, uh, he is a president of a European Jews for Peace, and he's also a spokesman for ship to Gaza. He was in Mavi Marmara when the attack was uh, done, and he was like imprisoned for a month. So you have a person who does the very radical noise music, but at the same time involved in a very strong political activism. In, uh, in uh, Sweden, he was almost a member of parliament with the Trotskyist group, uh, the party, Socialist Party. So yeah, we have a very interesting, let's say, an example of a person who insisted on that, let's say, opacity, on that strong currents in art, very radical forms, very difficult to to absorb, but at the same time did not, uh, did not, uh, did not, uh, let's say, uh, detach from the political activism. And he has an interesting theory of how he combines these two. That's, that's for example, an interview. Uh, other stuff that uh, Rab Rab so made this uh, uh, journal, this is the second issue, then we made another one issue that I can talk a little bit about on a subject called uh, outside of forest. 
outside of forest, it, it would be interesting for you, so I am talking a little bit in detail. Also, in our website, you can download third issue. It is, has a very uh, local, local, let's say, intervention, local aspect. In Finland, where journal is based, Helsinki, a project around the forest, around this environmental aspect of forest, tend often to be very nationalistic, sort of mystical, very much influenced by Heideggerian ideas. You know, so we found this quite a problematic way to talk about a forest and uh, to combat this, let's say, cultural conservatism. We introduced an, uh, a text of Karl Marx from 1842 as a way to discuss a forest in a different way. i tell you a little bit about it. So Karl Marx in 1842, when he was promising left Hegelian, had his idea to have a brilliant art theoretical interpretations of left Hegelianism, he was commissioned to write a text about uh, privatization of forests, actually the laws that Prussian assembly introduced to criminalize a people who were collecting a dead wood from the forest, which is their right, no? And while he was analyzing, this is that Marx's famous text on theft of the dead wood, while he was studying the parliamentary meetings, minutes, of how these new laws was introduced, he of course came up with a very important thing that for him until then was not so obvious. That is that the laws are not neutral, but are made to protect interests of certain class as a violence against another class. And then he became communist. He became what he became, no? And uh, that conversion... Yeah, started studying law. Yeah, started studying law, studying concrete things, concrete, uh, concrete uh, things that concretely matter how the state and the capitalism runs. And then he, let's say, that moment of conversion, of change, of that, that let's put it like that, coarse abstraction. You know, you make an abstraction, but you come with a to, you know, very like angry conclusion. Is that abstraction doesn't make you more, more let's say, refined. It made it more, more angry person. So anyway, through this metaphor, then we had worked through collecting the various texts of that uh, of interventions by artists and some scholars. There are a lot of interviews also with different people. And uh, so among the big part of third issue, you would ask what this has to do with the uh, with, uh, forest question, is uh, about the Russian avant-garde. We have a very long interview with Margarita Tupitsin, very interesting scholar of Russian avant-garde, who has introduced uh, a political conjuncture as an important merit to understand these artistic developments, let's say, from Rodchenko or, you know, whatever, so including Malevich. Uh, Avant-garde is an important subject of Rabra Press. We have uh, published uh, several books. If you don't mind to go to the next, this is one of the first little pamphlet that I made in uh, 2014 on Zaun language. And Zaun language is now uh, an, an important element, uh, let's say, important topic of one series of books in Rabra Press. I will talk a little bit about them. But before Zaun, in Russian means beyond sense sometimes translated as a transcends or transmental in French. It is kind of Dadaistic poetry made of like consonants and vowels. 
you perhaps know from the sound works of the already, already discredited futurists, but also uh, by Dadaists, you know, by Hugo Paul and others. So this is a sound poetry, the meaning made through sounds, which first instance, at the first look, looks like a meaningless, a gibberish, cacophony noise, but the authors of this kind of poetry claim that it actually has even deeper meaning. That's Zaum. Zaum in Russian avant-garde in the beginning of 20th century tend to be the most important, as Shklovsky would say, device. There is no avant-garde artist of any merit who haven't done something about Zaum or written about Zaum from Hlebnikov, Mayakovsky, Krushonik, all, but including more leftist artists who wrote after the revolution, like Sergei Tretyakov, Boris Arvatov, Osip Brik, they all have done something around Zaun, which is this nonsense, very opaque, very difficult forms, very abstract language. Trotsky wrote about Zaun. Nikolai Bukharin commented about Zaum. Zaum was a subject. Because what is interesting, like the most of the abstract art work in Russia, which started pre in 1913 and continued during the war, during the most nihilistic period in the Russian Empire when millions of people were dying, Zaum was then quite popular. But what is very interesting for us today and for leftist scholars like us dealing with these subjects is that after the revolution, most of the people claimed the relevance of Zaum, claimed the relevance of this radical abstraction in the new political conjuncture. And they vehemently did so. And that was like a very important question for me, that people has that confidence into abstraction that during this very political period of Soviet Union tending to expand the revolution on the international scale, that we have these Zaumniks, they're going with their own, own methodologies, with their own work. Kazimir Malevich even earlier called his suprematist paintings as Zaum paintings. Kazimir Malevich, when he reformed the edu educational school in Vitebsk under the UNOVIS, which took from Mark Chagall and completely revolutionized. He wrote a little book on a new systems in art and wrote as an epigram something, ULLK, our new path. And then a student, not student, assistant, Lazar Lisitsky, changed his name to L. Lisitsky taking let L from Malevich's epigram, which is El Lisitsky's name is actually a Zaun name. It is very interesting. There is a plenty of discussions on Zaun, and, and the reason that uh, I made this little pamphlet, it was produced in Tbilisi in Georgia. I was in art project there, artistic residency program. And what struck me as a very problematic is how the scholars in Georgia, but elsewhere, talk of a Georgian avant-garde as a nationalist project. Georgian avant-garde which flourished in 1918. And to me, this seemed completely uh, outside of the, the real historical, uh, let's say, uh, facts, what was happening during that period, because yes, Georgia was not Bolsheviks, they were Mensheviks, but still we can call them in a way left, much more left than anything Georgia saw after 90s. And uh, these organizations, these platforms of futurist avant-garde in Georgia and Tbilisi was very international. Even their idea to have a Zaum as their, let's say, a language in art was because Zaum was very much uh, capable of incorporating different languages. So in any poem of avant-garde poems, or 
for other works published in, uh, in, uh, in Tbilisi in 1918, 1919, 20, 21. You have some Turkish words alongside Georgian, Russian, Armenian. And this is, that internationalism is very interesting. And they were very leftist. The group, which was founded in 1919 called 41 Degrees, I will a little bit talk about them, headed by Ilyas Danevic, Igor Terentev, and Alexei Krushonik, claimed that 41 Degree is a left wing of Futurism, which takes Zaum as a mandatory form in new art. So you have, when you have these elements, when you have these facts, it is difficult to translate them into a nationalism and claim that Georgia, a pocket, an oasis of the, of the banality of the East is very much related to European culture and the avant-garde was the affirmation of this Georgianness of this, like, uh, you know, independent European being. So this is, I found, very problematic. That's why this little pamphlet is intervention to that. Uh, but to generalize this discussion, because this is a subject we very much talk with uh, Joe, and we, we aim to further this, uh, with this uh, project. Uh, this is a symptomatic to most of the Eastern European studies of avant-garde, which is a very revisionist, anti-communist uh, anti uh, position of interpreting this avant-garde from 20s, 30s by completely silencing the political aspect, the importance of political institutions, political movements, political conjuncture, and all that. Uh, this revisionism in this case is almost like, uh, like total absurd, but also we can see that revisionism in the case of Karel Taige is dealt. So with uh, Joe, we made this uh, translation. I jumped a little bit the subject because we are in the same sort of theoretical, methodological uh, field now. Maybe we should give uh, credit to Greg Evans as the, the actual translator. Yeah, we are the co-editors. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, I think it's a good translation. It is an excellent translation of the book Tiger wrote in 1936, Yarmark Umeni, Marketplace of Art. And again, you have a lot of translations of, uh, of uh, Taige. MIT Press has like three books mostly focusing on his architectural, typographical, urbanist projects, which are very interesting, very important. And uh, because it developed the technique also of, of like typography, how design is made and all that. But for Taige, this was symptomatic to a larger utopia that he was after. That is that non-dogmatic communist internationalism. And, uh, and that aspect in, of like scholarship dealing with Taige is more or less, you know, silenced. Or especially in Anglo-Saxon world. But uh, Joy is telling me Czech scholarship is perhaps suffering a little bit from that methodological <laughs> problem, <laughs> which is not methodological, obvious ideological. But uh, so we translated this book with an uh, extra commentary, extra book, which includes a commentary uh, of uh, by the uh, contemporary theoreticians of art who deal with the left issues or are themselves active politically. Esther Leslie, for example. Esther Leslie, she is a founding uh, member of Historical Materialism Journal and also in editorial board of what I would say one of the best uh, historical journal, Trotskyist uh, perspective called Revolutionary History. And she wrote a couple of books on Walter Benjamin. So she commented uh, Tiger's text alongside with Dave Beach, Paul Wood from Art and Language Group also involved in the avant-garde uh, theory and the scholarship. 
So this was an approach and the local surrealist uh, commentaries, uh, local writers that Joe was in touch. So I think it is a, it is a non-academic, but quite a rigorous and uh, engaged approach to Taiga's critique of the art market. Yesterday evening, we had a launch of this book. Uh, it, it can go forever to talk about it, but maybe uh, it's, this is not an occasion. Uh, just maybe to summarize yesterday's, let's say, conclusions, because we had a quite long debate about it, is that Taige, Taige wrote this book in a quite a particular moment of a crisis where he had a fallout both with the Stalinist dogmatic Communist Party and with the uh, local art, uh, art uh, some art movements. And when he had the complete try to introduce surrealism as a new form of uh, developed form of socialist realism, and where he got completely disappointed both from the art and the left and wrote this angry book against art market. And it's amazing. And to summarize, thesis is that there is no democracy in bourgeois culture. And no democracy within the rule of the art market, which is always in the background, is an ancient regime based on nepotism, on this kind of uh, very, uh, very non-open relationships. So yeah, this is our approach to Taiga, a bit political. And uh, yeah, as a rub rub, can you jump the uh, one more? Yeah, one more. Yeah, maybe you can go slowly, like every one minute. Yeah, with this because I have several images from this book. This is a book. Unfortunately, I don't have it here. Yeah, one cup. You have here yeah. with you. Oh, great. You can. Yeah. Thanks. It is uh, called Coiled Verbal Spring Devices of Lenin's Language. This is a book we published in 2018. We're late to publish in 2017. Here is a book. You can have a look. Maybe you, yeah. Uh, spend a lot of resources, a lot of time uh, to make this book happen. Uh, this is the first English translation of a special issue of LEF, Left Front of Arts, edited by Mayakovsky, published in May 1924. It includes uh, commentaries by leading Russian formalists, which are literary and art theoreticians. Some you might know, like Viktor Shklovsky, Boris Eichenbaum, Yuri Tinyanov. Mayakovsky commissioned them to interpret Lenin's language because they write about Zaum, they write about uh, Pushkin, everybody, but uh, then it kind of, he had an idea because, you know, Mayakovsky, after Lenin's death in G January, wrote this long poem on Lenin. And he told that the scientists of the soul, what he called the Russian formalists, and those who really know the magic of the language, can teach him how, what was the magic in Lenin's language, so he can write the poetry scientifically. But of course, he wanted, he had a, he, Mayakovsky, had a strong belief that the avant-garde ideas, because Russian formalism, Opoyaz and all this was started before the revolution, and none of them were any Bolshevik. And none of them were even leftist. Shklovsky, but from the corner, a member of socialist revolutionaries, which were vehemently against Bolsheviks, who in fact wanted to assassinate uh, Lenin. Anyway, so uh, Mayakovsky introduced this idea because he really believed that an avant-garde uh, discoveries has a relevance in that day's uh, conjuncture. And they wrote these articles, very interesting texts. A very, uh, very uh, playful, uh, very also rigorous uh, study of the speech, uh, revolutionary speech, the language of Lenin. To some, like, there are different interpretations. Some of them, Eichenbaum especially, deals with Lenin 
as a Venin's language, as a language which was perlocated or or was like a built, was made up in an underground, in complete illegality. A language which had nothing to do with bourgeois culture, had nothing to do with the war, with capitalism, with any institutions. And that developed its own, let's say, form, which he was analyzing. But uh, most of uh, these texts, and that what, ma that what makes these analyses so contemporary, so interesting, they deal with uh, unresolved contradictions. That was 22, 24, 23, 24. That is the question of NEP, new economy policy. Very important, very traumatic moment for most of these uh, Bolsheviks, because you have a Lenin who, of course, lived developed all these ideas underground with a very disciplined party structure, quite theoretically developed, but at the same time on the practical measures of distributing the pamphlets, of organizing the events, very capable, very agile, you know, the movement. But then you had the whole state to build, the whole institutions to run. And then you have a moment of introducing a little dose of capitalism, which is the NEP. The idea here, which most of these uh, formalists are recognizing, and it is very, very well uh, analyzed also by one uh, Marxist scholar, um, historian, Georges Haupt, if you are familiar with French, uh, one of the most interesting uh, historian of Marxism, especially beginning of 20th century. It is the same, uh, it is the same uh, conclusion that uh, Lenin, when introducing NEP, he actually was introducing this militant subjectivity. He was introducing the primacy of politics over economy. He wanted to save revolution by, let's say, uh, giving up, giving some concessions regarding the economy, economistic aspect of, of the so socialist uh, regime. So the first text, be uh, better few but better, for example, and other two where he introduced the NEP ideas, they were censored in, in Pravda. They were for a long time not even published because it was completely a new, new idea, new contradictions, new difficulties of this uh, conjuncture. And that is the texts, that is the language. Rus Russian formalists like Eichenbaum, Shklovsky, and others are especially analyzing. So they don't analyze the, the canon of Lenin, how Lenin was speaking, but how Lenin did speak, how actually Lenin end up with his last words in contradiction. So in, in fact, they deal with a more unresolved contemporary situation of that uh, socialist period. And that's, that's why these uh, texts are quite relevant and uh, very interesting to read even today. Uh, book also includes, you can go back, where is the uh, back? Yeah, one, yeah, here, thanks. So the uh, book includes a long introduction that I uh, worked quite a, a long period to discuss, again, revisionism. That is really what artist, art theory and art historiography, especially of avant-garde, is suffering today. And uh, one very obvious question is here, how come that such an important literary theoreticians like Shklovsky, Tignanov, and others, their writings, most of them translated in different languages, debated, but the ones about Lenin, not. Or like when they are mentioned, they are completely dismissed as an unimportant moment of the Russian formalist writings that was very much connected in a way, to their wanting to be part of this new power system. 
So this is the writing of Boris Groys. This is the writing of Victor Ehrlich, Halina Stefan. All those avant-garde historiography or theoretical position which connects avant-garde with uh, some Nietzscheanist will to power. No, sort of they wanted to be on the power and their eccentric ideas kind of was connected to Lenin's crazy ideas. But when you look a bit more careful, the relationship between two, the avant-garde and the communism is much more complicated. It's a much more interesting and it was uh, in fact, not such an easy translation. And it was not a good period for the avant-garde to get uh, into the idea for being a part of these existing power structures, because power had that contradiction as well, let's say, particularly with new economy policies. So that is a long introduction. And then there is a pamphlet, which in 25, Kushonik, a futurist published after reading this left issue called 11 Oratorial Devices of Lenin's Language. It is a Zaum interpretation, quite interesting. And afterward, by Darko Suvin. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with Darko Suvin, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Belgrade published a book of Darko Suvin called Radiography of uh, Yugoslavia. It's an excellent book analysis of, uh, of the bureaucratization of a socialism in Yugoslavia in 60s and 70s with these uh, uh, market reforms within the self-management. But Darko Suvin is more than that. When he wrote this book, he was 88 years old. Now he's 93. And before that, in 73, he wrote an excellent book called Metamorphosis of Science Fiction, which is Viktor Shklovsky's formalist ideas applied into science fiction. Earlier, he was uh, involved in the International Brecht uh, Association. I think he was even president for some time. So interesting person from Yugoslavia who lived in, uh, in Canada most of his life, now lives, lives in Italy. He wrote an afterword. And he wrote an afterword about this strong anti-war language of Lenin that this is a language which is completely outside of war mongering. And uh, if you can go a bit, uh, yeah, this is Kutsi's uh, photo montage, okay? If you can continue, yes, more. You can see only Lenin's uh, nose if you open the flaps, <laughs> not recording his voice. So yeah, then we started uh, something uh, called Bie Bao series. This will be eight volumes in total. Uh, it's dedicated to a rather obscure, actually, I will not say obscure. He was uh, central to many interesting and important movements, but rather unknown avant-garde artist from Georgia called Ilyas Danevich, or Ilyazd. Maybe as Ilyazd, you might know Ilyazd, uh, it is an name he took when he moved to Paris in 1921. And from then onwards in Paris, Ilyaz Zdanevich was a typographer, designer, made a, he's a person who, re, who made an art out of books. Today, for you who are interested in art world or engage, the artist books are an important component of artistic practice, but that started with people like Ilyas, who insisted on this expanded form of, of publication, of a book as an art. Anyway, so uh, he was active already in 1910, 11, with Goncharova. Uh, then he introduced Marinetti in 1912 in Russia. So he was behind a lot of futurist avant-garde activities. And in 1916, he made a play in Zaum language called uh, Janko, King of Albania, Janko Krul Albanskaya. It is a Zaun play, quite interesting, very noisy. Even there is one noise album by an industrial musician from uh, Finland, actually, called Janko Krul Albanskaya. It's very interesting, uh, very canonical 
uh, work of art because it introduced this, uh, what he called orchestral zaum, when the few people are uh, simultaneously performing the uh, various, various uh, lines, which are adding the noise to the noise. So this is mostly on, on, on zaum. But uh, interesting is that in 1916, he made this work, this play, which is critical of uh, Russian expansionist uh, policy toward Albania. It is a critic of the war in Albania, of the colonialism happening in Albania, and made in Zaum language. There is an introduction where you understand what is the subject. So that was for me very interesting to find out that, again, very radical, very extreme work of art dealing with the actual political uh, issues. You know, also Mayakovsky has a poem from 1915-16, a line saying, to whose pockets are going all these golds from Albania? Do you know this line? Mayakovsky has a, in one small poem. So anyway, uh, Zdanevich then in 1918, because in 1916 he couldn't publish this uh, book in St. Petersburg because of censorship, because the book was against the war and had a quite a explicit language also at parts. Uh, he managed to publish as a book that he himself designed in 1918 in Tbilisi. It's a beautiful book. It will you can find it online. Zdanevich, Ilyas, Janko Krul Albanskaya. And uh, in there, when he published, he added a line which didn't exist in the original play called Ae Bie Bao Biu Bao. Zao. That's why Bie Bao said it. And uh, so Zdanevich was in. Uh, St. Petersburg in February, but also in April when Lenin visited and declared his April thesis. And famously, he said, he heard Zdanevich Lenin saying, the people need peace, the people need bread, the people need land, and they give you war, hunger, and no bread. That's famous, like, we have to stop the war immediately. And these uh, words Zdanevich translated into Zaum. I B A Bao Biu Bao. So this is Lenin's words translated into Zaum and added into the uh, into the uh, Yanko book. That's why the, the series is called Biu Bao and deals with the legacy of. If you now just go slowly one after another, deals with the legacy of uh, Stanevich, but especially in important in his uh, leftist. Uh, more uh, internationalist uh, interpretations of this Zaum project. The first volume is his lecture on uh, Zaum, Le Degre 41 Sinapis, lecture on pearl disease. Sort of Zaum is like a pearl. It's very singular, very difficult. It's not arbitrarily random. It's not something a mess, you know, it's unique. And uh, each of the volumes have the same components, a bio-bibliographical intro. Uh, by the way, Zdanevich was also known with writing and publishing a lot of bibliographies. He was a bibliographer. And uh, then the uh, text, always first English translations with a lot of annotations about circumstances, people, and uh, interventions by people who are not necessarily expert of Yas Danevich, uh, but are dealing with similar subjects. Uh, first one is Elvin Brandi, Freya Edmondes. She is a noise musician, very interesting. And uh, second is uh, Zdanevich's autobiographical lecture, also with same components. Uh, commentary is done by jo Johanna Drucker, American scholar who wrote a lot of books on the techniques of visualization in early 20th century, but as well an only existing biography of Zdanevich. And she's also a visual poet. So ask uh, Johanna Drucker if she can condense 280 page Ilya's book into five page of visual poetry, which she did. You will see some parts there. 
there. This is the second volume. Second volume includes something that I'm really proud of, and I think you would find it very interesting. It's a uh, letter Zdanevich sent to Ardenjo Sofici, not a known figure much, Italian futurist, who made the typographical poems. I heard recently made in English also. 30s, he became neoclassical painter and extreme fascist. Like after the war, Americans tried him for a month, like whether everything is clean, right? So this is a person, Ardenjo Sofici, who in 63 wanted to commemorate 50 years of futurism and approached various actors, including Ilyas Zdanevich, who refused to meet him and wrote him a letter why, and explicitly explained his uh, political credentials. It's ontological text, translated from French. It's a complete demarcation from the uh, right-wing avant-garde and all that stuff that happened. And it is uh, very much about Picasso. By the way, Ilya Zdanevich made, designed most of the books Picasso. They were very good friends. And here he writes, how important was that Picasso joined the Communist Party? Actually, he has even the thesis that if Picasso didn't join the Communist Party 20th century after Second World War, would not be same for art. I think this is okay thesis. Uh, and uh, so there are a few other interesting stuff here. Uh, third volume is a bit obscure, but interesting. It's the first English uh, booklet, actually, of, about Igor Terentiev. You will see uh, uh, this book a uh, bit more. Uh, also has the same components, uh, in interpretations of uh, text by Igor Terentiev, who in 1919 in Tbilisi wrote a biography of uh, Stanevich with a very poetic title, Tenderness Record. And, uh, and then there is a letter. This is very interesting. Terentiev sent to Zdanevich in 24 from Leningrad to Paris when he was a director of a Zaum or running the Zaum department at Ginkuk. Ginkuk was a state institute for artistic culture founded by Malevich, where Malevich introduced the additional element like in abstraction, if it doesn't make sense in sociology, it's nothing, kind of. You know, the event Malevich also uh, introduced the design aspects, uh, suprematism as a new curriculum and all that. So Terentiev was heading the, uh, running the department on phonological study of Zaum, and from there sent a letter explaining of their discoveries, of their attempt to translate Marx into Zaum, which apparently they were doing, but these are not surviving, and uh, attached a play called Giordano Bruno, a sound drama. This is uh, included here. This is the series uh, dedicated on sound. Then, uh, do we have time? Can I continue 10 minutes more, or what is the situation? Maybe if you can be a little quicker than 10 minutes, but you could say a few words about uh, Otto B. Heidi Merin and Otto B. Heidi and Lars yes. and Future Plan. Okay, good. So, uh, we publish other books too. We have a series on punk called Punk Research Series. This book is called Punk Suprematism. This is uh, called Theoretical Writings on Punk, Nation, Art, Bureaucracy, and Socialism. Uh, English translation of uh, Rastko Mochnik, Slavoj Žižek, and uh, Zoya Skušek's writings on punk from 83 and 84. A very important for their career. This is our bestseller. I cannot not talk about this. This is uh, called Free Jazz Communism, uh, third edition. Uh, it is dealing with a festival dedicated to peace, international festival organized by a left, Communist parties in Finland in 62, uh, dedicated to anti-colonial struggles, but also for the peace movement, was 70, visited by 17,000 people, including Angela Davis. But the uh, interesting thing that we followed in this book is a concert by two black musicians from US, 
Archie Shep and Bill Dixon, avant-garde free jazz musicians. And uh, they were sent to the festival by CPUSA, Communist Party of United States, and which we kind of think this particular case reverses and challenges the all that uh, narrative discourse about Cold War instrumentalizing the black music. You have here the opposite, that the most avant-garde advanced uh, musicians from US came with the communist, not with CIA, that is a normal kind of ordinary uh, interpretation. And yeah, we interviewed Archie Shep. He's still playing. And uh, he's like 83 now. Uh, interview is called Black Music Survived Not Because, but in spite of capitalism, I think quite a important sloganistic statement. And uh, he gave us several texts, very rare texts from 60s, from that leftist period that we included here, reconstruction of the festival, testimonies by Angela Davis and others. So this is the book. And uh, similar other books on the music that I will not go in detail, Joe, ask to tell about a little bit about the forthcoming projects. We are planning to uh, continue with this form of work, finding the people who were in the uh, orbit of the left parties in between two world wars, or somehow attached the fellow travelers, so to say, or sometimes even member of the people who were member of the party and who were also trying to introduce the avant-garde ideas. Would be several uh, projects, uh, one dedicated on Lajos Kashak, and here is potential translator Aaron Rosmankis, who is talking after me here. And then we are working also on one interesting figure called the Otto Bihali Merin. Otto Bihali Merin, uh, as a Jewish uh, intellectual from Belgrade, socialist. He was a member of two communist parties, both Yugoslavian, underground, and German. And uh, he and his brother, Pavel Vihali, they started, they were introducing all these uh, Malik Verlag titles in Yugoslavia, also the uh, Russian uh, progressive avant-garde titles in 20s found a journal and publishing house called Nova Literatura Nolit. And when Germans uh, occupied uh, Belgrade, Gestapo's first victim was Pavel, uh, brother of Otto Bihali. Otto was in uh, somewhere else, hiding. And uh, in 37, during the Entartete Kunst exhibitions of National Socialists, the degenerate art, when uh, Nazis were uh, uh, criminalizing avant-garde, persecuting avant-garde, Communist Party, German Communist Party commissioned Otto Bihali Merin to wrote a reply to this, uh, and he did. Uh, it is a book called uh, Modern German Art, immediately translated in 15 languages. English version is uh, prefaced by Herbert Reed, famous uh, leftist art historian. Uh, Otto Bihali Merin was one of the editors of Lynx Kurve, uh, worked with George Lukács, but also he was one of the founders of Institute of Study in Fascism in Paris, and he is the one who commissioned Walter Benjamin lecture auto producer. Very interesting figure, very much connected with party structures, but always, let's say, in the fringe of avant-garde, in the fringe of progressive ideas. Uh, he continued, he was very active after the Second World War, wrote on very interesting subjects, and, uh, and it is him and some others as well who are behind why Yugoslavia had such a progressive cultural politics, such a progressive art productions, and so generously supported as well. So we do uh, another book on uh, Otto Bihali Merin, uh, which will be uh, his uh, very uh, interesting autobiography, this size, where he talks his like, collaboration from Brecht to all these people, and then with the commentaries. Yeah, I think it's good that I mentioned Otto Bihali Merin.
Yes. Nice. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to. I wanted to hear this a little bit to get a comparative perspective from a lot of these cases. Uh, yeah. Can I mention one more thing? Because you know, I I noticed like it's so much men I mentioned, but uh, we are doing one project, a very interesting uh, book about Larissa Reisner. Uh, Larissa Reisner was a poet from the very bourgeois class, but uh, his father, her father, uh, was uh, not part of a Bolshevik uh, circle, but a very important socialist uh, scholar. Anyway, Larissa Reisner, in civil war, joined the Red uh, Reds and uh, become a part of the uh, uh, naval some uh, troop, and uh, she was a very interesting uh, poet, and she started to write uh, reportages from the Civil War. And she continued to write uh, several reportages about Germany. She wrote a book on Hamburg Uprising, which is now 100 year. That is the only book available in English by Pluto Press. Anyway, not much known figure except that now historical materialism and Haymarket published her, republished a biography by Katie Porter. So we are doing a book on uh, Larissa Reisner's unpublished text with Katie Porter and including another uh, little, I would say an artist book on a film that was done by Harun Faroki and Inge Moengström in 1975 called About Narration on Larissa Reisner, uh, which is a very interesting film of Faroki and Engström. Uh, that is, what sort of film we have to make, what sort of uh, type of uh, forms, montage we should use to tell a life of such a militant woman. She died young, and when she died, Trotsky, Pasternak, Shklovsky, Karel Radek wrote obituaries. Very important writer, has a six books, managed to publish during her life. And uh, she is a poet, not important, but a reportages. She has a reportage from Germany in 1924, where she said, the future of this country will be under the shadow of swastika. So very interesting. Uh, if you have a time and uh, ability to find her already available translations, and I'm sure there is something in Czech, uh, you should uh, look after Larissa Reisner. is also uh, a, a project that, uh, a book that we are publishing. In fact, this is almost ready, publishing this October. I had to mention one woman, Larissa Reisner. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I have, I have one question, but I want to, uh, about comparing the time before uh, and uh, and the contemporary moment in publishing. But, but as, first, I want to open up to the public to see what questions you have, in case you want to jump in before Sezgin answers that. Uh, yes, first in front. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you what, first, what the background uh, means. Uh, uh, when did you get the idea? What does it mean exactly? Thank you. I wanted to ask you what rap rap means first. And um, the second question is more general. Uh, during your theoretical career, um, have you found some kind of device uh, against avant-garde art to be co-opted by mainstream media, culture in general, some like universal device against this co-optation? First question, <laughs> it's, it's easy. Rub Rub came from a sound that uh, uh, ducks cup, coupling, you know, the sex call of ducks. That's from there. And uh, not some big uh, meaning, it's Dadaistic. And uh, in reverse is Barbar, of course. Uh, but uh, about the second is, of course, a very general question. And uh, I think that's like, uh, you know, really what I try to do by uh, what is a device? Maybe device, it will be too, let's say, uh, 
a big claim to to like for me to say like I found a device, but at least I I have some ethics with with what I am opposing this recuperation and cooptation. I don't uh, reproduce the already existing uh, uh, productions or, or materials of the institutions. Like for example, I got of course as a publisher a lot of offers from art institutions because you know you have an exhibition and they want to have some nice looking book. I don't do that, never. Never with the academic institutions either, which is like, oh, we have a big Marie Curie grant, millions, can you publish our uh, collection of like, let's say, an articles of, no, you know. So in that sense, uh, it's difficult. This, but that ethics for me, that you have your strong independence, that subjectivity, you know, I, I keep it. I uh, let this kind of an ethics as much as I can. Of course, there are collaborations with an institutions, but it's it came from us. You know, this is the thing that this is a problematic. We think it is relevant. This is a ideas that we want to work on, and we find the possibility. That's it. But not we don't reproduce an institutional logic. So that's categorically against. Like that's the no-go area. Maybe <laughs> that's the answer. Then uh, Peter Rohel in back. Takže bude překlad, jo? Dobře. Já se pokusím z několika okruhů. To umění avantgardní někdy mělo takový, takový rysy utopie, čili vztah avantgardy a utopie. A hlavně by mě zajímalo v současnosti. Co je, dne, co je dneska tedy avantgardní umění, řekněme, spojené s nějakou levicí, utopie. A já jsem narazil třeba na, tady v České republice na literárních festivalech, že je vzniká řada děl, které jsou dystopií, to znamená utopií, katastrofy, které jsou spojeny s kritikou kapitalismu, ale jsou současně rezi, rezignací. Eh, druhá věc, pokud se týká eh, Tajgeho, bych chtěl jenom připomenout eh, prostě jména eh, čes, české avantgardy, které, které by bylo dobré, eh, dobré znát. Jo, to je Záviš Kalandra, eh, komunistický intelektuál, byl popraven v 50. V 50. letech a věnoval se hodně i české avantgardě, myslím, že i Tajgemu a velmi ho oceňoval také André Breton. A druhý, který vlastně navazoval, a to, by, to je Egon Bondy, který úplně jako v pubertě, prostě kolem těch 16, byl unesen surrealismem i komunismem a potom, potom vytvořil jakousi takovou reflexi stalinistického Československa, ten směr se jmenoval nebyl sám, totální realismus, měl období, měl období potom v 60. letech, kdy podporoval maoismus a té nějaké radikální levici zůstal věrný a má za sebou tedy velmi rozsáhlé filozofické i literární dílo, které ta avantgarda byla prostě důležitý zdroj pro něho. No a poslední, poslední věc z, z Ruska, Aha, jo, takže... Já, 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 já jsem si zapisoval, jo. Jo, takže teď to zkuze, já už potom jenom nesmírně krát, nebo můžu to doříct už? už, už jo. jo. Rus, Rusko, tam možná by stálo za to v té obecné ekonomické rovině se zamyslet nad tím, jak oni hned po revoluci tedy kontrolovali závody buď dělníci kompletně, anebo se rozdělili tedy z vlastníky, nicméně ta kontrola byla, takže to, to, to byl ohromný, stále podle mě nedoceně 
zmíněný pokus o hospodářskou demokracii a já si myslím, že něco z toho se možná promítlo do, i, do té, i do té avantgardy. Politicky, pokud se týká Lenina, tak je dobré přemýšlet o těch takových demokratických proudech v bolševické straně, to byla dělnická opozice a demokratičtí centralisté a z těch autorů já myslím, že je, nebo za, že je důležitý Erenburg, který, který měl snad, jako v encyklopediích se to o něm udává, jak tu avantgardu a takovou tu pozitivní utopii, tak úzkost předvídání už toho nástupu stalinismu. No to je tak vše. Dobře, dobře, tak abychom stihli ještě. Já, um, yeah, OK. Uh, a možná ještě, jestli pokud jsou nějaké další otázky, uh, Dobře, tak, tak přeložím to, tyto otázky. Um, so, the first, the first question was about avant-garde and its relationship to utopia. To what extent you see this pointing towards the utopia as part of the avant-garde, if I'm interpreting it right. And then the second was to bring it, the question back to the contemporary moment and the contemporary avant-garde. And maybe that's where I can, well, afterwards I'll add my question. Um, Uh, uh, and uh, so then this is more a comment, I think, than a question, just uh, in terms of relating Taiga to Zavish Kalandra as another important figure, was actually a friend of Taiga's as well as being a collaborator who was, uh, uh, was killed before Taiga uh, had, uh, before Taiga died. Um, and, and also Egon Bondi, who was inspired by Taiga in the avant-garde and later had an important influence on Czech radical left culture in its own way. But that was more a comment than a question, I think. Um, and then also relating the avant-garde to radical economic democracy and experiments in the early Soviet Union, as well as the workers' opposition in the Soviet Union, if you see connections there. Uh, and then another comment was just relating the avant-garde to Yeah, Ehrenburg, which is maybe a very big question, Ehrenburg's relationship to the avant-garde. Maybe you don't have, I don't know if you want to get into that. But um, then, then my question was uh, also looking at the contemporary moment, thinking about how the, both the art world and the publishing world, uh, the left radical publishing world, have changed in part because there is not the big party as a point of orientation that people either were members of or in the orbit of or directly collaborating with and whether um, how, how you feel like what, what has to be different, what are advantages and disadvantages of that situation in the contemporary moment, maybe looking back to before 1917 when also there was like radical, sort of more radical and progressive art and publishing projects were often more separate from political Like socialist organizations, the organized movement, were a bit more separate, and then they had more collaboration in the interwar period, and now again, maybe there's more separation. But yeah, thinking practically, like how do you see, how do you do publishing, have, how does it have to be different from the way Taiga, Bihadi Meri, um, uh, Zdanievich did things back then? And if you can finish, sorry, we have to be a little bit brief, so we have a short break before the next panel. Okay. Uh, so uh, this uh, question about uh, for the relevance today, I think it's a very, very uh, difficult to now engage briefly. But my idea is that we are living in today. Of course, we are dealing with the past, but uh, all these books are also intervention against most of the time to these revisionist, very liberal interpretations of these radical gestures. So in a way, relevance, if can have any ideological, partly political relevance, would be that. But uh, I, of course, uh, not directly in this, because these are very specific. This is very specific projects that I have presented. But I also write other books regarding the art. I made a book called Contemporary Art and Nationalism, 
dealing how today's contemporary art, claiming to be very global, very internationalist, it is actually reproducing and is part of very nationalist, conservative ideas. Uh, the, that I didn't come to present, sixth issue of the Rab Rab Journal is dedicated, and that was my plan, but couldn't succeed so well until now, to push the uh, journal uh, into a project that would make a use of Trotsky's uh, Leon Trotsky's thesis from the history of the Russian Revolution, but also before he wrote about it, called Uneven and Combined Development. That is, Trotsky analyzed that every contemporary formation inherently, especially in capitalism, has also archaic structures. So Trotsky was aiming to completely get rid of this evolutionist, historicist you, which is very dogmatic and later became a diamant, diamant with uh, Stalin, but uh, he had a very uh, sort of uh, strong agenda to show that contemporary of capitalism actually is quite traditionalist, even includes the elements of ancien regime. You know, like uh, amalgamation between the archaic and contemporary, in fact, a really we talk often about this. It is a, a dynamite against this uh, dogmatic idea, this historicist idea of the uh, correspondence or synchronicity between modes of production and forms of exploitation. It gets done with that lie, with that myth, which, which in fact says that you have the feudal modes of production and during that period, you have the feudal forms of exploitation. But we, in today, contemporaneity of bourgeois kind of culture, of contemporary art, you have like existing a feudal forms. And this is contemporary art. It's very undemocratic, the structures, the institutions. That's our thesis. So we came up following this Trotsky's analyze. And today, I'm sure you are pretty well aware the whole Marxist scholarship lives with making a quite interesting analysis through applying uneven and combined development. And uh, we had this, we have this radical thesis. Contemporary art is not democratic. Based on nepotism, on corruption, on all oligarchs, on all traditional values, and this also reflects to the very form of contemporary art is done, not only the ethics and uh, the way how institutions operate. So yes, of course we have that, let's say, contemporary leg, you know. But again, we are referring to some historical, uh, like let's say, uh, traditions like Trotsky and others. So yeah, that much. But about Ehrenburg, let's not go into that, please. We yeah. can talk. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I think we should uh, finish there. So thanks, thanks a lot. Just to say that books are available if you want to get some copies. Yeah, I recommend them. Yeah. <laughs>